Saab built a reputation, especially in the 70s and the 80s, for their own quirky brand of safety and sporty. Along the way, they developed a nearly cult-like following, but it wasn't enough to prevent the company from falling apart into a soap opera-like story of mergers, acquisition, drama, and bankruptcy. This is a far too brief history of Saab. Welcome back to All Cars, y'all. I'm John, and Saab has a personal connection to my love of cars. Back at the dawn of my interest in all things four-wheeled, my first desire was a 64 and a half candy apple red Mustang convertible with a white top. But my second was a Saab, and I still remember it. It was a magazine, I believe it was called Turbo, and they had a black two-door Saab 900 on it, and I absolutely fell in love. It was the first car that really stirred me emotionally and made me crave a car. I apologize in advance for my pronunciation of any Swedish words in this video. I am, I promise you, doing my best. Parent company Saab AB was founded in 1937 as a defense contractor to help the Swedish government build defensive aircraft for the upcoming war and defend its neutrality. Saab itself is actually formed from Svenska Aero AB and ASJA from Linköping, and the name Saab actually derives from their full name, Svenska Aeroplan Ategbeolg, which means basically Swedish Aeroplane Company Limited. Not the most original name, I guess. Anyway, the story of Saab starts at the end of World War II. Since most production in most nations had been switched to the military, by the end of World War II, there was a shortage of cars for consumers. And Saab was looking to diversify their business, decided to start a car project. In 1945, they started with the internal code name X9248 until it formally became known as Project 92. Interestingly, it was named Project 92 because it was the next in sequence after Project 91, a single-engined trainer aircraft. They made four prototypes of this Ursaab and before they settled on a final design for the Saab 92. The manufacturing in Trollhattan was converted and in December 1949, production began. This was an odd-shaped car. It had a transversely mounted, water-cooled, two-cylinder, two-stroke engine of 764 cc's, making all of 25 horsepower. The engine was actually based on a DKW design, with DKW being one of the companies that formed Auto Union that eventually became what we know as Audi today. So you could say eh, the first Saab used an Audi engine, but I actually wouldn't. All the first cars were painted in dark green color, similar to British racing green. It is said that after the war, the armed forces of Sweden had a surplus of green camouflage paint and sold all the surplus off to Saab. Interestingly, Saab's rally racing history started almost immediately when their head of engineering entered the Swedish rally in a 92, just two weeks after the car was released. He came in second in his class. In 1953, they updated the car as the 92B, which got a larger rear window, larger luggage space with an opening lid, three exciting new colors like gray, blue-gray, and black. Other yearly changes through the 92's life improved performance and safety. Through the mid-50s, about 20,000 92s were sold, and in 1955, the car was redesigned and re-engineered and renamed the Saab 93. Premiering in December 1955, it now had a three-cylinder engine that was slightly smaller at 748 cc. It was still a two-stroke engine that now made 33 horsepower mated with a three-speed gearbox. With Saab's focus on safety, it got two-point seat belts in 1957 as an option, and this model also featured the first variation of what would be Saab's iconic grille. In 1958, they introduced a sporty version of the 9.3 called the GT750. It had the same body, but in 59 and newer models, it had front hinge doors. It made safety belt standard equipment. The engine got twin carburetors and pushed power all the way up to 50 horsepower. And there was an optional tuning kit that got it up to 55 horsepower. In 1959, they added a wagon variant called the Saab 9.5. 
Only 40 were made that first year, so it's pretty common to reference production as beginning in 1960. It used an 841cc version of the same three-cylinder and continued in variations of body and engine through 1978. Also worth noting is that in 1955, with the introduction of the 9.3, Saab introduced the Sonnet, but also known as the 94 or the Super Sport. Intended to be for the U.S. market, this was a two-seat open-top roadster whose name didn't reference Shakespearean poetry, but a Swedish phrase I will not attempt to pronounce, but that means, quote, how neat it is. It used a 57 and a half horsepower version of the 93's two-stroke three-cylinder. Only six were made between 1955 and 1957, and only two exist in the U.S., with one of those apparently being at GM's Heritage Center. The name would return in 1966. The 93 was the first Saab exported from Sweden, primarily to America, and at the end of production in 1960, they'd produced over 52,000 of them. The 96 was introduced in 1960 and had an astonishing 20-year run. Resembling the 93 in the front, the rear was heavily redesigned for a larger window and substantially larger back seat and trunk. Many major modifications were made over two decades, of course, but the car was introduced with an 841cc version of that same three-cylinder two-stroke engine, and the car had a higher output version in the Sport and the Monte Carlo models. It originally had a three-speed transmission, but two major changes were coming. The first is that the three-speed was phased out and a new four-speed became standard, and it finally had a synchromeshed first gear. The second, and far more interesting, is that the car got a Ford V4 four-stroke engine. This honestly deserves its own video. In 1962, Saab launched Operation Kajka to source a four-stroke engine. Between 62 and 64, engineers tested three different engines from other brands, but the CEO at the time stopped the project, not sharing the view that Saab needed a four-stroke engine. The engineers went around the CEO to the major shareholder and began testing in secret multiple engines, including the new Ford V4 from the Taunus, the Volvo B18, and the Triumph 1300, among others. The Volvo was the most reliable, but the Ford engine was very close and fit easily into the engine bay. They rented a house to meet in secret. They set up another company to keep purchases of V4 specific parts a secret, and with just five months to go before production, only seven people in the company knew about the plan. Even the purchasing department was completely in the dark. It appears that with only four weeks before production, a few more people were told when they invited about 40 staff back to the office to work on what was supposed to be a disc brake problem. The 1.5 liter V4 was introduced in 1967, had 64 horsepower, and while the two-stroke continued it as an option until 1968. Of course, with the new 9.6, a new version of the Sonnet was released, and it too got the V4, and the 95 also got the engine. The car and engines had many changes over its life, often struggling to meet emission regulations, and notably in 1971, it got a 1.7 liter version of the engine that was slightly downtuned with lower compression. Sales of the 96 ended in 1973 in the US, but the model in its 20 year run made over 547,000 produced. And in 1968, an even more influential car was coming the Saab 99. This partially replaced the 96, but was also technically a size larger and falling broadly into the compact executive category. It was available until 1984 and helped define several Saab features for decades, such as wraparound windscreens, headlamp washers, and side impact door beams. Planning for this larger car began in 1964, with the first prototypes were actually 96's cut in half long ways and widened by 7.9 inches. They later labeled some of these test cars as Daihatsus to disguise them. They decided it needed a four-stroke engine, and for some reason they didn't use the Ford, they decided on a 1.7 liter Triumph Slant 4 engine from the Dolomite. 
but with a carburetor developed especially for Saab that produced 86 horsepower. Interestingly, they had several with Triumph Stag V8s, but they dropped those in favor of turbocharging the engine. The 99 was released in the autumn of 1968, with only 4,190 produced. In 1970, the four-door model arrived along with an interior facelift that made it more luxurious and an optional fuel-injected engine with an available three-speed automatic. In 1971, the engine was upsized to 1.85 liters, both carbureted and fuel-injected models. Saab found the Triumph-sourced engines unreliable. They brought it in-house, they redesigned it, and this became the Saab B-Series engine and was used after September 1972. With such a long lifespan, there are many changes and improvements to the car, but there are two here to highlight that really set Saab up for its most famous years. The first is that in 1974, the three-door Combi Coupe was introduced, what we would call a hatchback. And secondly, in 1978, a turbocharged version was released. This was a two-liter engine making 143 horsepower with a top speed of 124 miles an hour. While the 99 continued, the 900 was about to be released and make history. Over its life, over 588,000 99s were produced, not including about 25,000 Saab 90s, which were 99 front ends and 900 rears, and they were available between 84 and 87 and intended to be a base model to replace the 96. A special note is the Sonnet 3, introduced in 1970, but based on the Sonnet 2 chassis and available ultimately until 1974. The first year had a 1.5 liter V4, while models year 71 through 74 had the 1.7 liter version, but also down tuned to meet those US federal regulations. It was more tailored for the US market as all were a left hand drive. It had a floor mounted shifter when most Saabs had a column mounted one at the time, optional dealer installed air conditioning and pop up headlamps that were manually operated. It was a very slow seller, with only 8,368 sold over a five-year lifespan, but Saab also experimented on this platform with a steam engine. In 1978, Saab unveiled the legendary 900, and over two generations, it was on sale through 1998, selling nearly one million units. Of course, there were many changes and variations, and we will not cover them all here, the 900 was originally based on the 99, but lengthened and available in two and four door sedans, three and five door hatchback models. Like the 99, it was a front engine, front wheel drive with the Saab B engine installed at a 45 degree slant. Initially, there were four versions of this eight valve engine. A single carb produced about 98 horsepower, a twin carb with 106, a fuel injected version good for about 117, and that 2.0 liter turbo with 145 horsepower. Safety took a top priority as the 900 continued the wraparound windscreen of previous models for visibility. The dash was curved to be ergonomic with the most used controls logically arranged by frequency of use. The steering column was collapsible and Saab introduced a pollen filter to the HVAC system. In 1980, the four-door sedan was introduced, naming was simplified, and the B engine was phased out for the newer, lighter Saab H engine, which was itself a reworking of the previous B engine. In 1984, the Saab introduced the 16-valve version of the engine that produced, with an intercooler, 175 horsepower. In 1987, there was a major styling change, primarily sloping the nose with new headlamps, but also the convertible became available and became almost an instant classic. In 1989, the eight valve engine was being phased out as were the carbureted versions. The 16 valve engine made 126 horsepower without the turbo and in 1990, Saab made available a light pressure turbo badged the 900S. 1993 was the last model year of what became known as the classic 900. Overall, 900,000 900s were built, of which nearly 49,000 were convertibles. Now let's pause the 900 story and dive into the business of Saab and the 9,000 and subsequent models. Trust me, it matters. 
Back in 1978, Saab entered into an agreement with Fiat to sell the Lancia Delta as what was known as the Saab 600 and to jointly develop a new platform. This would become ultimately the 1985 Saab 9000 and which also underpinned the Alfa Romeo 164, the Fiat Chroma, and the Lancia Thema. The 9000 was introduced in 84 and it lasted until 98, although its replacement, the 95, was actually introduced in late 97. The 9000 was developed on what became known as the Type 4 platform. Although it took nearly six years to fruition, the 9000 was meant to be a top of the line car for Saab, but ended up looking much like its Fiat and Lancia brothers, although really only seven exterior parts were actually interchangeable. Unlike the 900, the 9000's engine was installed transversely, the ignition switch was up on the steering column, there were a wide variety of engines used, both naturally aspirated, turbo, 2 liter, 2.3 liter, and even a 3 liter V6 late in the model's life. Over its life, over 500,000 9000's were produced. Rolling back even further, in 1969, Saab AB merged with Scania to form Saab Scania AB, and in 1989, the Saab car division was restructured to be an independent company. And this is where the drama begins. General Motors and Investor AB, an investment and a holding company, each controlled 50% of the new Saab Automobile AB. GM's $600 million investment gave it the option to purchase all the shares within the next decade. Saab at the time, for all the successes it was having with the 900 and the 9000, had been losing money. GM spurred the next generation 900, sharing the GM 2900 platform of the Opel Vectra and the Vauxhall Cavalier, used since 1989. It was sold from 94 to 98 and offered a variety of engines, including two versions of the 2 liter or 2.3 liter Saab H engines, both in naturally aspirated and turbo versions and 2 liter only, and a 2.5 liter version of GM's European V6. This platform abandoned Saab's longitudinally mounted engine for a transverse layout and a rear hinged hood. A convertible version was introduced in 1995. Interestingly, they offered a Sensonic variant on the turbo models that was essentially a clutchless manual transmission with the clutch controlled by electronics and servos. While the car was responsible for Saab finally making a profit in 1995, the model was never as loved as the classic 900 was, nor did it have the same quality reputation. In 1997, which was Saab's 50th anniversary, the 95 was released to replace the 9000, and the 900 was facelifted and renamed to the 93. The 95 was the first Saab without the combi body option in 20 years. Now, the 95 offered only a sedan or station wagon body styles. It was based on the same GM 2900 platform as the 900 previously. It offered 2 liter and 2.3 liter Saab four cylinders, the GM 3 liter V6, as well as Fiat, Opel, and Isuzu diesels in some markets over its lifetime. This first generation lasted until 2009. The 93 was rebadged and updated and sold through 2003. Saab claims that over 1,100 changes were made between the previous 900 and the 93, such as revised suspension, revised styling, but still including three or five door hatchbacks, improved crash worthiness, and much more. It continued to use versions of the two liter and 2.3 liter Saab engines, but also added that Opel 2.2 liter diesel. Over 326,000 of this first generation 9.3 were built. While I haven't tried to cover all the variations of every model we've talked about, for the 9.3 it's worth mentioning one of my favorites, the Viggen. This is Swedish for Thunderbolt, and it's named for the Saab 37 Viggen aircraft, and its turbocharged engine made 225 horsepower, and the car had upgrades to the intercooler, to the ECU, clutch springs, and drivetrain. Only 4,600 were ever made. In 2000, GM exercised its right to acquire all remaining Saab shares, making the company a wholly owned subsidiary. The first model from this was the second generation 93 in 2003, where they abandoned the classic hatchback in favor of a standard four-door sedan. 
I believe in an effort to move the car up market and to more directly compete with makes like BMW. It was also based on the GM Epsilon platform, once again shared with the Opel Vector, as well as others like the Fiat Chroma, the Cadillac BLS, the Chevy Malibu, and the Saturn Aura. The Saab engines were now gone. They used the GM 2.0 liter Ecotec engine, as well as three different versions with a turbo. This model sold through 2012. GM also decided to expand Saab's product lineup by badge engineering other products from other manufacturers. The 92X was based on a Subaru Impreza. The 97X was based on the Chevy Trailblazer. They were introduced in 2005 in a desperate attempt to increase sales. Both were critical and commercial failures and were canceled only a few years later. In an effort to cut costs, GM delayed the 93 wagon. They stopped development on a 93 hatchback. They stalled development of all-wheel drive for models until 2008, and they canceled a 95 replacement in 2005. By 2008, GM announced Saab was, quote, under review, and ultimately they allowed Saab to go into administration, and a nice way to say, moving towards bankruptcy. In June 2009, supercar maker Kozingeg announced they would purchase Saab from GM, backed by Norwegian investors and a Chinese manufacturer named BAIC. The deal hinged on a loan from the European Investment Bank, and while the loan was approved in October of that year, by November, Kozenyang had announced they would not move forward due to delays and coordination among the various parties. In December, BAIC announced they would acquire the intellectual property and production equipment for the previous 9.3 and 9.5 for about $197 million, with the intention of creating a new brand. But GM announced they would be winding down the Saab brand, then car maker Spiker put together a group and submitted a bid which was ultimately successful. An entire book could be written about what happens between 2010 and 2011. In fact, one has been. To keep it short, GM agreed to supply Saabs with engines and transmissions as well as a completed vehicle from Mexico called the 94X. Throughout 2011, Saab struggled with money shortages, sometimes not paying employees, they stopped work because of lack of parts, Spiker tried to get additional funding, including from a Russian banker who was blocked by the investment bank for questionable business practices. A Chinese car manufacturer named Youngman and an auto dealer named Peng Dai stepped up. There were multiple threats by the workers' union to force the company into bankruptcy over unpaid and delayed paychecks. They were issuing new equity to raise the money to pay salaries, and the Swedish enforcement agency essentially started seizing assets and forcing their sale to pay debts. GM announced they would not continue to license its technology if Saab was sold to a Chinese company. With no alternatives, Saab officially filed for bankruptcy in December 2011, with Saab valued at $500 million in assets and with over $2 billion in debts. Through all of this, the second generation 9.5 was released by Spiker. But that's not the end of the story. Saab sued GM for illegally blocking the sale to Youngman and others, but in 2013, the suit was actually dismissed. In 2012, it was announced that Saab and its assets were being sold to a Chinese consortium called National Electric Vehicle Sweden, NEVS, NEVS, with the intention of building an electric version of the then-current 9.3 model and continued development of the next 9.3 called the Phoenix. GM continued to refuse to license the technology in the 9.5 or the 9.4X, so they would be abandoned, and interestingly, Saab AB and Scania AB owned the Saab trademark and refused to allow the use of the Griffin logo, but Nevs could use the name on future cars. In 2013, they began producing their first vehicles, and in December of that year, they replaced the 20% of the parts originally sourced from GM and began producing gas versions of the 9.3 again. But by May 2014, they stopped production, apparently due to one of the partners in NEVS not providing the promised funding for operations. By June, multiple companies had filed debts with the NEA, and by August, NEVS had filed for bankruptcy protection. Saab canceled the agreement letting NEVS use the Saab name, and ultimately 
Nevs got two new Chinese partners and by 2017 was producing their own car based on the 9.3 in China. In conclusion, the downfall of Saab is one of the saddest of my lifetime for a brand that had immense loyalty from consumers. In fact, that loyalty has been given a name, snobbery, which includes a general disdain for other brands like BMW. I love it. Saab is one of the brands that I would most love to see to make a resurgence, and I'm shocked that no one has tried to take it on. Durable, safe, quirky, and for those that don't want another BMW or Mercedes, I just really see a market for this. It's easy to look back and wonder if this is just another example of everything GM touching being ruined, and the massive what if any other company had bought into that 50% ownership. One can understand GM's moves, the platform and the engine sharing to reduce development costs, changing body style to something that was considered more upscale, but each step eroded what made Saab special while chasing those incremental sales. And if those products were excellent, it may have worked, but instead GM took mass market platforms and tried to compete with luxury brands. Finally, they just badge engineered other cars as Saabs and consumers weren't fooled, but by then the damage was done and all the Saabness was gone. And honestly, it's just such a crying shame. Back in the 2000s, I came close to buying a 9.3. It was black, it had a black interior, it was beautiful, although I really did want a hatchback version. Still, I thought I'd have my dream of finally owning a Saab until I went and actually drove it. And honestly, it felt all the world like a Chevy Malibu. The ride, the handling, and the engine, none of it felt special or quirky. And it made me realize why they failed. Many thanks to my Patreon supporters, and if you like content like this, please consider supporting independent news pinions. I appreciate you being here.